Have you ever heard of Colgoa Floodplains National Park? Well, that's where I'm heading today. I'm heading to Colgoa. It's a remote area park in outback Queensland, right on the border with New South Wales. It's a bit over 200 kilometres southwest of St. George. Now it's a remote area park, so you need to be completely self-sufficient. And there's no facilities on site. Now I'm pretty excited about visiting this park because there's almost nothing on YouTube about it. It's virtually unknown. Probably because it is a bit out of the way of the typical traveler. Now there's meant to be over 150 species of bird in this park. But unfortunately we're going through a drought at the moment. So the park is meant to be completely dry. We'll head on in anyway and see what we find. Many wait to retirement to begin living their dream of travelling Australia. But I'm not waiting. I'm living my some days today. We've just crossed the border into New South Wales. It's only a temporary crossover. Once you head down to, to Gadooga, you head back north again, back into Queensland. Expansive pastoral properties for raising cattle and sheep are about the only thing you'll find out this way. I've passed through Gaduga. It's just a little Aboriginal community. Not much there, but the sign points the way to Colgoa. So there should be a cattle grid somewhere along this track with another sign that I follow. Across the border, back into Queensland, my home state. Not too far down the road is the Y Junction. You'll need to take the left to head towards Colgoa. I really feel this would be another great trip, although just to be out on the open road again makes me happy. This is the last cattle grid I'll see till my departure. Well, the drive in was pretty easy. I just had a chat to the ranger and he says pretty much the whole park is dry except for one spot where I'll be staying later in the week. I've got eight nights here and the first spot now is Vira Lagoon, but it's all dry. But I did see a few feral goats around, plenty of wallabies, so there's still hope that there'll be some bird life around to take a look at. I'll set up camp and relax for the rest of the day, I think. One thing to be mindful of when setting up camp out here are these animal trails. This one's really well used and it runs through both these campsites. Now it's mostly wallaby, but I do see a few other tracks in there, perhaps goat or pig. So if you're camping on the ground in a swag or a tent, you want to make sure you're out of the way so they don't run through your guy ropes and run over the top of you during the night. If you're up in a rooftop tent or a camper trailer, it's not such an issue. But just stay back a distance from it. That, that way it lets them hop through during the night if they need to and get to their watering hole. But yeah, very, very well used this one. This large flock of Major Mitchell and Sulphur Crested Cockatoos made an entrance while I was setting up camp. It was quite an impressive size and very loud. The park was created in 1994. It's made up of former stations, firstly Byra Station, and then along with later acquisitions of Tolby and Myola which took the park to its current size of 61,900 hectares. Plenty of room for exploring. Cattle and sheep are raised on the properties and the park is scattered with remnants of dams, fence lines, yards and homesteads. So I had a good look around today. 
along the lagoon and some of the tracks here the side and there's still quite a bit of wildlife here plenty of wallabies some emu tracks one emu far down the other end and still loads of birds I had a few good sized flocks of galahs fly over so this should be a good trip still even though the lagoon's completely dry so my first night I'm just gonna have a simple meal because I'm usually pretty tired driving in so mushrooms snow peas and some lamb chops easy Just look at the size of these gums that line the whole lagoon. Pretty much up and down. Big old gums. You would not want to come out here without shoes on. Some of these bushes are incredibly spiky. Pretty much covering most of the lagoon area. Some of these old scarred trees are pretty interesting too. I've seen a couple around that look like this. Very precise. I don't know whether it's something from the pastoral days or maybe prior Aboriginal, perhaps a shield or something. I don't know, it seems very low down for that, but I've seen a couple, so just wonder what they mean. There's a distinct lack of fire scarring on it, so it seems like it's never been burnt. So it probably wasn't caused by a fire. Most likely man-made. So it's currently mid-September. I'm here a bit late in the season really. That's just due to some health and car problems which lost me a couple months worth of travel time. At mid-September it's quite warm now, it's currently midday. But I'm walking around just fine. It's just starting to get to that point where Another couple of weeks time I think it'll be too hot really to, to really enjoy the place. But yeah, hat, long sleeve shirt, long pants, all good. It's, just, it's a dry heat so it's, it's completely bearable and acceptable. But if you're trying to come out here I'd say get here before September if you really want to enjoy the place. But when I booked my camping permit I looked online and I was the only person booked in for the whole entire week in all the campgrounds so it's very quiet out this way. Despite the drought that's going on at the moment, there's still a lot of beauty here to be seen. All the colours are very subdued, very subdued padded, with greys, browns, very greyish greens. Pretty much the whole landscape, just like that, it's, it's its own unique beauty. I bet when the rain does come, it livens up quite a bit, but it's something to be seen, I think, just to sit and enjoy such a, a minimalist palette. As much as I love going barefoot and walking around campgrounds in the bush, reconnecting to the earth, this is one place I wouldn't want to do that. Just check out all these burrs embedded in my tyre. Really big, strong, four-pronged ones. They'd be quite the nasty surprise. So it's time to fill up my day-use can. I always siphon everything off out of my 22 litre jerry cans into my 5 litre day use can so I can keep track of how much water I'm using each day. So I've got it strapped in here. In the old days I used to take the jerry out, put it on the side and just fit it in, which does mean a bit of moving around. But one of my subscribers told me about the jiggle hose. So I bought one of these jiggle hoses. It has a one way valve on it. And simply just a matter of jigging it in and the, the motion causes a suction which then siphons the water up and out into my secondary can. Now this can be used for both fuel and water so in an emergency if I needed to siphon diesel out of something I could use it for that but I wouldn't then use it for water again I'd keep it as a diesel only. But this is my water one. Now I've got my jerry here I used to have to take all this stuff out just to get to my cans. Now it's just a matter of straightening this out. I found it has to be pretty much 
directly down vertical, otherwise it won't work. So try and get it straight, bend the hose back out, stick it down into the hose. Yeah, it still needs to go down a bit, otherwise the level won't quite work. See that? Easily siphons it out. Minimal back strain and work for me to do. Just let gravity and suction do the work. Anything that makes life easier in the bush with less risk of back strain and injury is, is good. As someone like myself, I've you know, strained my back four or five times in my life. Most recently, only about a month ago, that was a mild back strain, but still put me out of action for about four days. And be sure to carry plenty of water into the outback. I've got three 22 litre jerry cans. There we go, perfect. Instead of having one large tank, if that gets punctured, I lose my water. But this way, three different cans. If one of them fails, one of the seams gets a crack in it, that's okay, I've still got the other two to survive off. Here we go, that was easy, painless. I'm only lifting five kilograms now instead of 22. Everything's still strapped in, didn't have to pull out the rest of my gear. And that's it, the job's done. Simple little tool like this, it's, I think it was only, only like $15, $20, but uh, worth, the, worth the cost. So a special thanks to the subscriber who put me onto this. Now I'll just pack it back in its little home and I'm good again for another day, day and a half. I'm only just starting to warm up now, so I'm just starting to get through about five litres a day. So I'm leaving Byra Lagoon and I'm heading up to Red Bank Hut camping area. It's pretty close, only a short drive from the range base. I'm just at a fork in the road, the main track we took in. That will take you back into New South Wales across the border. This right hand track, number one, that takes you up to Red Bank Hut and the rest of the park. So let's continue. This is inside Red Bank Hut. It's a remnant from the old pastoral days, so I don't know much about the history, but it may have been perhaps an outstation for some cattlemen, or maybe it was one of the original homesteads, I don't know. Very simple construction, just cast iron, some local timbers. Nothing too flash, just two rooms in a little add-on out the back. Then of course, the main kitchen area, an old or cast iron oven and stove top. It's just amazing how these things are brought in from who knows where. They still last, it, you know, made to last a lifetime compared to today's ovens. And the old bottles. I think this here was part of the old roof. It probably had a bit of a false roof to make it a bit more flash. Now here, various hooks and and wires, so maybe that was for storing meat. Not sure. Just imagine though in summer, living out here, how hot it would be in this little tin box. I think it's probably a place to just sleep at nights and then during the day you'd find a shady tree. But it's great to see that it's still here. Gradually the termites are eating away. Even had some electricity, a few wires. Nice to see though what some of the early pastoralists actually lived in. And this is part of the campground, so I'm going to camp nearby tonight. 
I'd love to see what's under the floorboards of these places. There must be coins, papers and other relics from the previous occupants, giving a glimpse into what their life was like back in the day. Just looking around at some of the trash, found an old metal beer can with the aluminium top and pull tab. <laughs> Just nearby, they've got their own dam. Well, another night's complete. Same meal again, lamb and mushrooms, I found a place I can take my shoes off so it's nice and burr free out here near the hut. I was just exploring around Red Bank Hut and right in the middle of the track I found these old nails. There's about a, a dozen of them stretched right down the track. So these would be quite the puncture waiting to happen. They're getting the wrong way. So I collect these up and get them off the track. Be sure to carry at minimum a tyre plug repair kit. I found many short pieces of barb and fencing wire on the tracks during this trip. It's quite the collection. Been here quite a while, it looks of them. Could be the original from the hut. Just across from Red Bank Hut, there's the remains of an old boar site with the water tank, a few water troughs, and the fencing. Would have been impossible to raise sheep or cattle out here without boar water. Looks like this lizard was out for a drink, but didn't find anything. Very incredible armour on top, very rough scaling. Still has the original float drum, but the mechanism inside. And here's the other half little mechanism there with the float on top stops the flow of water coming out. Found a skeleton, I think it's a goat. Looks pretty goaty to me. Nice size horns on it. Emu lives here. I'm heading northwest to the cattle yards, number three on the map. The cattle yards would have been central to the success of any station, with cattle rounded up and loaded onto trucks destined for market. If this was made for cattle, you'd want to be pretty slim. Very narrow chute, 
all the yards were made from local timber, just roughly cut and then tied together with fencing wire with the Cobb & Co hitch. Very simple construction and yet here it is here, basically still intact and yet it's been abandoned since 1994. Just incredible. The ball dust is thick in some places. Despite my best efforts at sealing up my truck, this track caused a lot of dust to be taken on board. Well, I'm at site 12, which is about halfway into the park, and the landscape changed quite dramatically, as if there was almost a line drawn in the sand where all that dusty, sandy country finished and this reddish, mauvey country began. Very different, much more bigger trees. So I'll show you on the map where we are exactly. So I've got a detailed map from the ranger base, a little information box out the front, which you really need because the parks map provided online is nowhere near detailed enough. So we started out here coming in from Gaduga and came up past the ranger base and visited Byra Lagoon camping area. And came down the main track, took number one, and headed up to Red Bank Hut camping area. Up here, headed on up and visited the cattle yards, and then took the side track out instead of going the main route. And somewhere around here, I got a bit misplaced and should have taken this track down, but ended up staying on the main westerly track until sort I of hit number 12 here. So there are some extra tracks out here it appears that aren't on the map from the old pastoral days. So it can get a little confusing but I generally just look at the map and then follow the compass to get the, the gist of which way to go. But just out here that landscape changed to more open that reddish sandy country. So I continued continue south from here down this looks like fence line and that should Get me back on the right track and head up to Nibbine and Creek and there's meant to be water there still. Let's continue. Well, I've ran out of bread yesterday, so it's down to Jats until I knock up for damper, probably tonight. Just a simple tuna and jats with tomato and cheese again. I found there is still water in some of the other dams, although the quality is dubious. The remains of a few kangaroos surround it. Another old pastoral ruin. This one has a beautiful old tractor. It's a hellish place to live out here though. There's just nothing really around here. I wonder how they went about getting spare parts out here for this thing. Probably a long wait. Stay tuned for part two of my trip into Colgora floodplains. To join me on my future travels, click subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to help support the creation of more videos, please consider becoming a patron. Click on the Patreon button on the screen now. Thanks for watching.